Greetings, Church. It's uh, um, Kevin DeClaren coming to you live on uh, Friday night. Uh, it is 8.09 p.m. on uh, Friday the 16th of September. Um, I just had Bible study, um, and of course, nobody showed up for Bible study. Uh, no Christians showed up for Bible study. No one showed up for prayer. Um, not even to say hello. The only thing that happened downstairs was two tenants. Um, one was coming in. Um, I was coming out of the uh, manager's office um, and uh, speaking to one of the workers, um, informing the worker that I'd been attacked uh, in the afternoon in the apartment here. Somebody came in um, and beat the hell out of my, my wrist here, um, and it's swollen. And this, you see this part of my, this was dislocated. Um, this was dislocated here in the apartment and right here it's swollen. Uh, somebody came into the apartment while I was um, resting and beat the hell out of my hand here and also um, also here in this part. Um, earlier this morning I woke up and I was in excruciating pain because um, MacArthur and Franklin, the gay community, clan, whoever those people are, they came and did a number on me. And so from 4 o'clock in the morning on, I've been uh, preaching against everything that they, they did. Um, and I was outraged, just pissed off at the fact that this is how I'm, I'm constantly being treated, like a slave. Um, and then I went over to uh, uh, 24 hours, worked out for a little bit. I could barely lift the, um, the weights because of the fact that this, I think, is fractured. Um, I haven't taken it yet to a doctor to uh, to see. Um, I thought it was because I was losing weight because I lost about 20 pounds. Um, but it wasn't because uh, I was losing weight that I couldn't lift the weight. It was because this was fractured right here. Um, I also had noticed that um, one of my bones was sticking out here, my collarbone. And I was beginning to worry that somebody was coming in and breaking my bones and sort of like rearranging my bones. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who if a chiropractor is is being is being called in to do these things um, this finger here was hit this finger here was fractured about two three years ago and it never straightened out and so after the finger it, it it's this part right here you can see it's just sticking out right there uh, which is which is you don't see it sticking out right on, on this 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 hand but it's sticking out a whole lot more on this one anyway um, long story short, I um, went to pick up my meds and um, then came back here. Um, I was eating a fruit um, and apparently the pear that I had gotten from the William House, William Booth Temple, um, I guess during the course of last night somebody put laxative in it and so I really had to sit on the stool for an hour and a half and so I just sat down on the couch here to kind of like let my body, um, you know, recover from from that hit because it was such a hard hit. And um, apparently, I fell asleep. I'm not exactly sure if I fell asleep because the apartment was gassed or because I still had that stuff in my stomach. But when I woke up, I mean, I was in pain. All of this entire area here was red. Um, the door was locked with a board behind it. Um, and so somebody climbed through the window and made the decision to um, beat me like a slave. And so this is what I've been dealing with here is the beatings of a slave. Um, they come into the apartment at night and they beat me in the head, back of my head. And this is the doing of Gabriel Franklin and John MacArthur. This is the doing of Guy Franklin and the um, probably either Sandra or the, I don't know if the manager is involved. Um, somebody has to open that door. Somebody has to climb through the window. I'm seven stories up. So someone is helping um, a lot of these people that I knew uh, back in the 80s and 90s. Okay, I'm no longer involved in their lives. But these are these are being these things that are being done to me today are being done by people from the 80s and 90s hiding in the background or the homosexual community representing the peoples that I knew from the 80s and 90s, which is Gabriel Franklin and her son Guy Franklin and John MacArthur and 
Jonathan Zabo and either Mark Rodriguez or somebody else. I don't I don't know, okay? I don't want to point the finger, but all I know is that I'm getting I'm getting hit and I'm getting hit hard. So I was just coming out of the apartment uh, out of the uh, um, the manager's office talking to Corolla, which is one of the female workers here at night, and she's a Hispanic woman. Um, and I was ca trying to keep catch her up to date with what was going on that I was being abused in the apartment. And as I was coming out, uh, two men were feuding. Um, I recognized one. I didn't recognize the other. Um, the white one coming in, the black one was saying, hey, how come you're, you know, you slammed the door in my face, you know, uh, which was an incident that I had with uh, a European couple weeks ago who had moved out um, and he was trying to sneak back into the apartment at five o'clock in the morning and I didn't want to be the responsible party to let him in. Um, everybody, he was an older man, um, everybody has to have their own uh, key wand. In other words, for you to get into the building, you need one of these. And if you don't have one of these, uh, the management basically says do not let anybody in. So I wasn't going to let anybody in just by the fact that I had recognized their faces. A lot of people had moved out. And the black man reminded me, um, and it, sort of, it was sort of like an indirect conf confrontation of something that had happened because the, the first man, the white man, was wearing my color blue, the color blue of the uh, of the vehicle that I had sabotaged and destroyed back in 2009 when I was living in Seattle, Washington at the trailer park. Um, that The back of that car was completely crunched in. Um, and, um, and so they were addressing that issue. And I didn't catch on right away. But when I, I turned to the African man and I said to him, you know, are you a tenant here? Because a lot of people that were here at the beginning of the year moved out and moved on and, and went to other apartment complexes so I wasn't sure if he was uh, still a tenant or if he was sneaking in or, or if he, what his intentions and motives were so I asked him and he exploded on me um, when he exploded on me I told him no you can't it's not me that you need to come out on you need to come out on the European who just gave it to you who just dissed you to your face um, you can't come out on me because I had nothing to do with it um, I had nothing to do with it. So anyway, um, I told the management about it, and I told the uh, office about it, and she she caught on to what was going on. But you know, that was Bible study. Nothing happened. I didn't even crack open my Bible. I basically just walked away and told the Lord, "Thy will be done." Um, in 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 this situation, in me living here, um, when I was hit earlier, I basically took the uh, case to the victims um, to, to one of the government buildings um, where you can file a restraining order on 4th Avenue and um, I went up to the 8th room 804 to try to file uh, a victim's advocate I went to the victim's advocate unit in 804 and basically it backfired um, the woman that they brought out was a light-skinned um, African woman about my complexion um, she was a little bit bigger than I was, and a little bit taller than I was, and her face was the face of a Gabriel Franklin. And the woman behind the desk was a dark-skinned African woman, um, who also was a Gabriel Franklin, who came on to me, and who came out on me, I should say, not come on, but come out. Um, I didn't respond, and so she sent for a lighter uh, 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 African woman who also came out. Um, and I, ex I basically went through my history explaining what was going on and the fact that I was being abused um, in Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, starting in New York State, California, Seattle, Washington, and then here for the last five years or so. Um, the end of the conversation, she, the victim's advocate uh, unit or victim's advocate um, office, basically what I think they did was they removed... Um, they removed the real workers and put in Gabriel Franklin workers because they know that I'm being dealt with by the race, by the American race, the European race, and Africans on the issue of subordination and slavery and submission. I didn't submit. And because I didn't submit and I bring out the sin issue and the problems that this is causing me as a Haitian American and also as a Christian, um, what she did or what the staff did behind my back was called security and have me removed. The, the two men that came up 
um, to remove me as security and um, they made mention of something somebody needing to be waxed and I quickly said I hope it's not me that's gonna end up getting killed but in any case the two officers one in the community was a Sandra de Claron and the other one um, in the community was a Guy Franklin so I, I went from dealing with Gabriel in the, and, and I'm talking about the people in the background the people in the front um, were I guess you could say they're the workers, but in the back who they were representing is Gabriel, Guy Franklin, and Sandra Duclaron, which are the people who are given access into my apartment to fracture and to beat my my body um, and to abuse my body, either uh, sexually or with physical abuses, um, since I can't seem to wake up to catch these people in the act, I don't have any evidence. Uh, since I don't have a camera uh, in the apartment that's set up to catch the people climbing through the window, the people opening the door on the outside. In other words, I'd need a secret camera on the outside of my door here on the seventh floor and a secret camera uh, both inside and outside of this apartment um, to catch who it is that's climbing through the window because no 90-year-old woman is going to be climbing through this window, but somebody is opening the door, letting them in, to do whatever it is that they're doing to my body sexually. I mean, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, these people have beaten me on my head and my on my hands and my wrist, um, my elbows, my my neck, um, my chest, my bottom. I mean, there isn't a part of me, my penis. I mean, there isn't a part of me that they have not exposed or or, or pulled down my pants or you know, it's it's just it's just one of those things. So I left that office um, on. Um, I think it's the, the the Superior Court. I think it's the Superior Court building. Um, Superior Court building on on the eighth floor. I left. I was escorted downstairs and um, removed off of the property. Um, I cooperated because I didn't need to be um, barred uh, for non cooperation. So I went over to um, the City Hall building and went to the City Attorney. Same setup. But instead of Gabriel, they had a Sandra, uh, same big uh, uh, African woman, my complexion. Her face, though, did not have the face of a Sandra de Claron. It was in her spirit. So whatever she did in her spirit, it, it, you know, to, to, to bring out this woman, um, she brought her out. And I jumped back and I couldn't believe that I'm not dealing with the American people. I'm dealing with American gays representing um, Haitians. So the European side never came out once, and those are the people that are giving these people permission to come out, okay? Um, and on the European side is MacArthur and Zabo and um, whoever else is from that Grace Community Church property. Um, and whatever European from uh, Europe or, you know, on, on the Franklin side or from New York State on the gay side. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. In any case, I spoke to the attorney's office, and she basically couldn't help me either uh, instead of being able to help me for real she she came she came down and she came out um, and I basically all I, I, I could do is just walk out of that office then I went over to um, the mayor's office on the third floor in the city hall and this was a different setup by the Africans they had a skinny black girl with long um, weaved in hair um, and um, and then behind her was an African man uh, probably about twice her age uh wearing squared shirt and it was it was it was a very obvious and basically all i said to them i asked her if she was the secretary and she said no he is and um and so she walked out of there and and um i think it's the office of charlie hales H H hayes hales whatever his name is um i never dealt with the european side in that office it's always the africans who come out representing gabriel in the gay community um in any case, looks like I just got hit from the back here as I'm doing this video. It says the required file may have been deleted or damaged. Reinstall this software. Canon, uh, my image guard. Now, I, I don't know what that is. I'm not sure where it's from, but it's a hit from the back. In any case, um, I, uh, I, I, all I said to the African as the woman was walking out the door, this was about 4.45 or so, was just, I'm not a gay, I'm a Christian, and I don't want to deal with the gay community. And I walked out and left the building. On my way back up here to the apartment, um, I 
ran into an African woman and I think I, I might have apologized and said, I'm sorry that your people are still not free, you know, that your people are still slaves. Uh, because the way they're dealing with me, um, it doesn't seem to me that Africans are free. You know, if I have to bring out my sexuality and I have to bring out my sexuality on the gay side, I can't be content in my sexuality in women that I'm attracted to, uh, women that I find to be lovely. Um, I, I think that's disgusting that I have to literally um, bring out my sexuality upon another male in order for me to claim freedom in the United States of America. Um, you know, and, and I think that's a sad, sad reflection of where our country has gone and where the government has gone also. So in any case, church, um, afterwards I crossed the street, this was Fifth Avenue, I ran into two American men and I told them, you know, it's a shame that this is what you're still doing to these people. Uh, and then I ran into two European females, American European females, and I said to them, you know, you need to keep your panties up and you need to keep your legs closed and stop uploading those sex videos because that's very enticing to men. In other words, you know, go conservative rather than being so liberal in expressing and exposing your, your flesh. Uh, that's what's getting a lot of men into trouble in the church side, you know. And anyway, I came back up here and had dinner and, and then the Bible study, and here I am now chatting with you. Um, you know, it, it's not easy because every day, I, I mean, I got to have my gay, gay dart on. You know, I got to be um, gay-minded. Yeah, and it's very frustrating um, being by myself because the Haitians are homosexuals. The people that I knew in New York State, they're homosexuals, and the woman is is very gay-minded. Um, her thinking, her thoughts, her reasoning, and I and I can hear her and I can feel her spirit. It's very gay-oriented. Um, in other words, she is constantly of the gay thought, you know, the same-sex thought. Problem is, I'm this way, right? This is me 24/7, seven, seven days a week. The problem is, I can't. For me to tune her out and to focus on what I'm doing, she becomes violent, and they honor the violence of this Haitian woman. The homosexuals honor her violence. The homosexual honor her, her sin. They honor the evil that she is, she is known to do, she's been given permission to do. So we're not living in a free country. We are in the last days. Um, we are in the days where Christ has warned that the love of men and the love of the church will grow cold. I, can, I mean, I, you know, Melinda was saying to me, and I hear MacArthur's daughter on my way back here, she says, you need to go to St. James um, and report this to the church. But here's, And you need to come out on them and ask them whether they're a clavern or not. I mean, how sad that here we are in the 21st century, I have to go to a church and ask them if they're a clavern before speaking to them about the Christ because they're so tuned in, not with the Lord, not with the faith, not with the scriptures, but they're so tuned in with the sin of their people. So if you have European Americans out there that are born again, they're not tuned in into the born again life. They're tuned in into the white American society that denies the faith, that denies the Lordship of Christ, that um, clings to the homosexuality of the nation, that clings to the bigotry. It seems like homosexuality and bigotry are the only thing that they have and they're holding on to it with dear life because if we let this homosexuality go, if we let this bigotry go, if we let this racism go, we will lose who we really are. Therefore, we're going to hold on to it for as long as we can so that we don't lose our real identity because our real identity is found not in God, not in Christ, not in knowing God in Christ by faith, but our real identity is found in, in being uh, a segregation, uh, a, a segregated race, uh, a great, a, a race set apart, um, and can't be touched by anybody. You can't have nothing to do with us because we're so superior and we're we're all of this, and and therefore, you know, it, it's almost like in that light, you know, they find peace in 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 um in basically separating themselves, and 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 I and I and I and I, and I, I can understand that from a from the standpoint of an unbeliever. Right, a person who does not believe in. I mean, I'm not just talking about Euros. I'm talking about Africans, Haitians, um, Jamaicans, Spanish, Asians, and all sorts of nations that are out there that I don't even know exists. You know, when uh, it's one thing for the nations to take that position, but it's another for a Christian church, right? An establishment where people of 
of, of, of Christ's Holy Spirit and, 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 and like-minded faith take that position and you can't identify with them because as soon as you walk out the door, they take the old position and they backstab you. Okay? Um, and, and now they have to go back and identify with their own, their own being those on the gay side, those on the clan side, those that are giving money to their Christian establishments to keep it going. Um, rather than those that are filled with the Spirit of God and who are interested in the work of salvation. So, you know, I'm looking at this situation and I'm going, I, I don't I don't see the end of the end of this. I don't see the end of this unless it's death of of, of somebody, my death, their death, or, or somebody else's death, because it's an ongoing thing. You know, people are not gonna stop sinning. They're not gonna stop living the way they choose to live. They're not gonna give God um, that open opportunity to bless them, to heal them, um, to call, to, to take out the darkness, the scales. You know, remember the, the Bible says that Paul had scales in his eyes for three days because he had persecuted the church and the Lord wanted him to understand that, um, you know, it's me that you're persecuting. It's me that you've put in jail. It's you, it's me that you've killed. It's me that you've done all of this to stop, you know, Saul, Saul, stop kicking against the goads. Stop kicking against the God. Stop kicking against me because every time you touched one of those Christians, you were touching me. Um, I think people like Gabriel and, and, and Dee Franklin will never be saved. I don't believe they'll ever be forgiven by God. I don't believe that God will ever touch their heart um, so that they could be born again. I don't believe that those people will ever be forgiven, will ever be pardoned, will ever have the peace of Christ. Um, I, I feel sorry for their family that they're stuck as slaves on the gay side. Um, and they will be su subjugated to the gay community for the rest of their lives. And in eternity, I don't know what God is going to do to them. And as far as the so-called brothers who pretend to be uh, Christians online and on Sunday mornings, but then when a Negro or when myself step up to them, they don't want nothing to do with me because of my poor reputation in Portland as a practicing homosexual, I feel sorry for those people too. Why? Because those people are double-minded and two-faced. Um, if they feel that I'm living in sin and what I'm doing is wrong, then they should have approached me. They should have spoken to me. We're the body of Christ. They should have showed concern as pastors and elders and leaders of God's church. They should have said, brother, why are you living a double life? Why are you preaching in the front and having carnal uh, contact and sex with males or females outside of the Lord's church? They should have brought up the issue and spoken to me in, either in, in, in private or public. Um, I've, I've made, I've put enough videos out there so that the church could step up anytime, right, and say what they need to say. They don't have to be incriminating, they could just address the issue for what it is. Problem is, in my dealing with this situation, they, for some reason, you know, the Word of God tells us to come out from among them. These people are not willing to come out from among them. Not in my case. For some reason, African men like myself are not allowed to identify with a lot of the Europeans who claim to be the church. What, what, I mean, I don't understand what part of salvation does not the European man or woman understand that once you're saved, you are no longer a child of the English European community. Once you're a child of God, you're no longer a part of the gay clan. Once you're a child of God, you're no longer, you belong to God. What part of that part of salvation do these people not understand that there is a separation between church and the unchurch? Those, and, and when I say unchurch, I'm not talking about the people who don't show up on Sunday morning to go to a meeting. I'm talking about the people who do not possess the Spirit of God or understand the Lord's position in salvation, right? And therefore, they can't embrace the Lordship of Christ, the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. They're the people who does what Gabriel Franklin is doing to me here in the apartment, sexually assaulting me. Um, they're the people who set me up at a porno store for me to uh, uh, get sex from gay men. Uh, and if I don't get the sex from the gay men, when I come home, they'll take the sex from me. Why do I visit those places? Because I don't want nobody coming into my apartment to take sex from my butt. Uh, to take sex from my genital um, and then to stick a needle under my foot or to stick a needle on top of my foot or, or to or to try to break my ankles or to do um, the things that they've been doing to my wrist. In other words, 
these are the things that I'm enduring and suffering as a believer. And I don't want to suffer these things in my own home, whether it be here at Gretchen Ford Common, West Shore Apartment, Grand Oaks Wilshire Apartment, Bush Hotel, or down in San Diego or, or Los Angeles. I don't want to have to deal with people on that level. Why is there a community of homosexuals so interested in my sexuality? What exactly is it that they're interested in? I don't think it's my sexuality that they want. I think it's my submission and slavery as an African. And the door that they open is the door of homosexuality to say, hey, we'll give you a taste of our genital. We'll allow you in our back door if you submit to us as a slave, as a subordinate. It'll be sort of like our little secret. You know, and I think that's the reason why they haven't removed the sex yet out of the porno store and put it in the apartment complex and put it in um, every church that I go into. In other words, I'm not cooperating, so they're not willing to take it off of that property to put it in one of your churches. And, and for us to have an understanding that that's the real me. Right? The real me is the, is the man that has an understanding that I'm now property of the gay side of the American people, not property of Jesus Christ, um, believing in, 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 in the gospel of our Lord, believing and practicing the Christianity that the Lord has called us to because that's how we reconcile to God. In other words, I'm not really the reconciled type. I'm not um, really with the gospel of, of Jesus. I'm, I'm really a homosexual who has an understanding of how to get and give homosexuality to the males and how to give a submission and subjugation and slavery to uh, white males. That could be Spanish white males, Asian white males, or European white males, any kind of white males who I'm willing to subjugate myself to. Right? Um, those that look like uh, Gabriel and those look that look like Guy Franklin. Uh, and since I'm not willing to go in that direction and I'm still trusting in Christ and trusting in God's gospel, the very first message that I was given, this is the direction that I went in with my life. So now, here I am before you again, and I'm saying this is where it's at, church. I'm, I, I mean, I, I, I can't apologize because I haven't done um, remotely anything uh, that deserves apology. Um, I think it's a sad thing that the church is, or the people in the buildings, because you have a building, right? And you have a campus, and you have all sorts of people going in and out of the buildings and the campuses. You don't know who the saved are and who the unsaved are. You don't know the people that have demons inside of them and can do some pretty uh, magical things. Remember, there are two Simons in the Bible. There's Simon Peter and there's Simon the Magician. So you don't know who who the magicians are um, who can falsify the faith and um, make themselves sound like Christian and who the real apostles are, men who have been blessed by the Spirit of God to do the work of the ministry, to bring people to salvation. I'm trained maximum, I think, um, on both ends, on the gay side to, to sin and also on the church side because I don't think I'm ever going to end up going back into a seminary. I don't think they'll accept my application, not after the videos I've put up, right? I don't think I, I'm, I'm, I'm ever going to have that opportunity to go back into a, a, a known church um, and, and finish, my, finish my degree, my MDiv, and, um, you know, marry a Christian woman have a family of my own and actually lead and actually lead God's church. I think initially that was the plan back in 96 when I first started with masters. But after some of the things that I've endured and been through, um, it's it becomes more and more clear and evident that um, the United States is not geared up or even prepped for uh, Haitians, maybe African Americans who submit and who subjugate themselves, but Haitians who have not submitted and who have not su subjugated themselves to what Africans are being demanded, you know, silently under their breath, you know, you need to submit, you know, you, you need to yield, you need to, you need to come down and, and you're not the lead. And, um, I don't think that's the position of Christ with his church. I don't think Christ's position is for us to subjugate ourselves and lead and yield to any clan or any gay community. I think the Lord wants us to, to regard him as first and foremost. Um, the sermon, sermon number four, um, for the series, God Wants Change, um, I think that's initially one of the, the key issue, the key factor. Um, in, in, in that sermon when I finally get around to uh, get preaching it in the public is that um, 
God demands from us that we acknowledge him as God um, in in um, Exodus chapter 20 I think it is 1 through 3 that we shall have no other gods before him and then when you go to Psalm 135 um, the psalmist says that our Lord and our God is above all gods right and then after that you go into um, revelations uh, I think it's like chapter 22 and the scripture says the, um, the you know we our worship doesn't go to Satan who demands who, who asks Jesus for it in Matthew 4 9 um, you know the gospel that we preach is the gospel from God that exalts Christ and God and therefore we are to worship God right like the like the angel tells um, the Apostle John in Revelations 22 I think it's verse 9 so you know I think those are the, the, the points and then I, I bring out the fact that we're um, there are false idolatrous gods in the scripture and there are false idolatrous religions in the world I think our and the point being that our relationship with God is what is um, what is at stake here in the United States of America our relationship with God is what is at stake here in in this country that's what is that is the main ingredient of our living on the planet um, you know, in the midst of all of my hollering and preaching and yelling and cursing and and saying some of the most hor horrendous things that I don't I I don't think any human being have had the nerve or the gall to say to an American people or an American society to defend my freedom as an American coming from um, coming from uh, the Thirteenth Amendment and also coming from Galatians I think it's five one uh, and First Corinthians seven I think it is where it says do not uh, they're, they're, uh, that we are not to put ourselves under a yoke of slavery um, and so I, that's what I'm fighting here is the yoke of slavery that that thing that comes around your neck as a yoke and they want to yank you and pull you and intimidate you um, to subordination and violence you know and I say to you Christians fight you know, fight until the bitter end, fight until the death for your freedom in Christ. Or else these unbelievers who are under the influence of Beelzebub, under the influence of Satan, under the influence of demons, under the influence of sexual immorality, um, the old and the young, the black and the white, uh, the international and the American born, um, these people have bought into the system of the world. And God tells us, do not love the world nor the things in the world. So, you know, the main point of Sermon 4 is that your relationship with God is where it begins. Um, and a lot of people don't believe that, but that is the core of what makes us who we are in the society. That, you know, it's either we're atheists who don't believe and therefore we practice and live a, a life of liberality that is without God, without the boundaries of Scripture, or we are uh, a people who have come face to face to understanding that you know that we've taken a step outside of the earth which is what I've been telling them you know take a step outside of the world right take a step out outside of the earth and observe right because when we do that first and foremost you see this little piece thing here that's upholding this that's not there the world hangs on nothing and it spins on its axis you know we need to have a God view of earth in order to understand um, a God's view of earth from the inside of the earth we need to literally step outside to observe earth so that we can understand earth and God from the inside because if we don't, if we don't have an outside view we're not going to understand him on the inside and this is what is drawing everybody's attention is the fact that we live in a world and we are so caught up in everything that's going on in the world but we have not taken a step outside of the world to observe the earth and to observe what God is doing. Uh, his authority, his divinity. We've taken um, the whole space travel thing and turned it into a movie like Star Trek. You know, we take it to, to boldly go to, to other places on other planet. And guess what we overlook? God. We overlook the fact that the power of God that, that is keeping the universe. Um, we overlook the fact that God is keeping the earth in, 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 in upholding um, man on a day-to-day -day basis and we've turned it into a space travel trip to go to new places and, and to find new monsters and to find new uh, galaxies right 
And the other day I was saying to them here in the apartment that we're looking for God outside of the earth in all of these galaxies and all of these planets and all of these places, but we're only finding monsters. When he came down to give himself to us uh, in the form of Christ, we wouldn't embrace him. And here we are sending, um, you know, academies and, and groups of, uh, of people uh, to go out into space uh, and, to, and to deal um, with all of these uh, terrestrial, um, you know, it's like the ET phone home ordeal. You know, we're looking for God in all the all the wrong places when He's He was right here among us, right? Um, and through the Holy Spirit, and he, and he sent us the Holy Spirit so that we may know Him. But yet, in our space travels and in our movies, we we're going out of our way into all the galaxies of the beyond the Earth to look for a God who's right here with us, right? And um, God in us, the hope of glory, or God with us in the form of Christ. So it's one of those things where it's like, man, it's, it's, it's interesting. And every time we go out there into space and we run into new, new problems in space, uh, you know, watch the new Star Trek, right? Um, wh what do we find? <laughs> what do we find when we go out there in space? More monsters, right? One monster even worse than the one we met uh, the last time we were out there in space. And in this movie, what you find is one of the leading monsters turns out to be an African man, okay, an African man who had been neglected when he reverted back to uh, away from his monstrosity to his humanity. He he it literally he transforms back into the black man, uh, and the black man in America today is is regarded as a monster, right? Not the image of God. And so, but in space he's a monster. Uh, on the planet he's a black man. You know, so we the the problem that that the, these space travelers have, you know, they they have the same problem. You know, when you take a monster and you bring him back to planet Earth, guess what he is? A Negro. Um, and if you remove them out of the Earth and you send them on a straight space traveler, what do you find? A monster. So it's almost like, what are they communicating here, right? Really, what are you, what are, I mean, how racist can you be about um, how racist of a message could that be? right against the African people um, and, and and I say this with 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 tongue-in-cheek because I just dealt with an African man who was pissed off um, because I asked him if he was a tenant and here it is it wasn't me that pissed him off it was the European but he didn't take it out on the European he took it out on me and I told him no you need to go back and deal with them because I'm not the one who who did that who, who insulted you all I did was try to confirm whether you are a tenant okay but in any case this is this is how, this is the message, um, this is the message from Sermon 4, uh, and, and the whole point of change is that God wants us to, to change from worshiping these false idol, idols and, and these false um, deities, right? Because remember what I said in Psalms 135, uh, is, it says that our God and our Lord is greater, you know, than all the gods and all the lords. Um, and the, the point being that um, we need to have a relationship with God by faith and we need to do it now um, because our time is dwindling you know our time is passing by I'm already 45 and I've been preaching this message since um, since I came out here in, in, in 99 right and um, I gradually came out um, and now here I am full-blown preaching the message but it has not won me one convert Right? How can a man preach so many messages and yet not one person has come to salvation? Right? Um, the Church of Jesus Christ used to have apostles who they would lay their hands on you and um, automatically the apostles, the Spirit of God would descend. Today you go to church meetings and you go to church um, revivals and you wonder, you know, is the Spirit of God here among us? You know, you feel the spirit of the people, you feel the, you hear the prayers, and, and you feel the energy in the house, but is the Spirit of God really with us? I want to read you a passage out of um, Timothy, and, and the scripture says here in 1 Timothy 3, let me find it, that, um, I think it's 1 Timothy 3. Uh, um, let's see here.
Oh dear. <laughs> I just lost my glasses and uh, I usually keep them right here on the desk and uh, over the course of time my eyes have gotten so bad that I need um, to wear reading glasses and now here I am searching for them and they're missing. You know, they're missing, they're gone. I don't know where they went. But the key here is when I read this passage I think this is a lot of what's going on today. Um, and when I say today, I don't mean just right here, right now, but I think in our age, in our generation, um, this is what's going on in our time, right? Um, Wonder where I could have misplaced those glasses. I don't know if anybody came in here and took them. But let's see here. Well, I guess I'm gonna have to use these glasses. But I can't see very well. These glasses are scratched. So anyway, the scripture says this. It says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, right? Difficult times will come in the last days. I would say from my videos and all of the time that I have um, dealt with the wickedness of Gabriel and the wickedness of Guy Franklin and the wickedness of the community, the gay community, the world and its communities, right? I would say that we're in the last days, right? Because the scripture says difficult time will come. Now, Keep this in mind, keep this in mind, is that um, a thousand years is like, a thousand years for us is like one day for God. So when God says the last days, we're not looking at it from his point of view. We're looking at it from our point of view. From his point of view, the crucifixion could have just been two or three days ago. But to us, it's 3,000 2, 2, years ago, 3,000 years ago, right? So. The Lord may say, um, so the last days would be, oh, just seven days ago. For us, is 7,000 years, right? Um, so when the scripture says here, realize this, that in the last days, uh, times, it, difficult times, difficult times will come. Last days, meaning the days closer to the return of Christ. Um, the days closer to the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And the great tribulation the last days being the time of the antichrist the man of lawlessness um and so every single day of the year we get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the return of christ right to the return of christ and i want to make a point here is that you know some people are tired of my preaching and some people don't want to hear anything that i have to say church they hate me being outside heralding the word of god and I'm thinking, and I was reading Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 6, and I'm going to come back to this passage in a minute. Remember, we're talking about the last days. In Isaiah 6, the scripture says that um, Isaiah went before the Lord, um, and he saw the Lord sitting um, lofty and exalted, um, on, and, and, and with the train of his robe filling the temple. And seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out uh, while the temple was filling with smoke. Uh, then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. So this is Isaiah's vision. And Isaiah says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom, and who will go for us? 
then I said, here am I, send me, right? Um, who was he talking about? The people of Israel, right? Um, so God sends Isaiah uh, into to a commission to the people of Israel. And then verse 9 he says, and he said, um, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive, keep on looking, but do not understand, render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and repent and be healed. Now here's the, the, the verse that I want to point out. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord uh, has removed men from afar, and the forsaken uh, places are many in the midst of the land. Uh, yet there will be a tent a portion in it and it will uh, again be subject to burning like a, a, a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled the holy seed is its stump I lost my train of thought there for a second I thought I heard MacArthur's voice in the background but the first that I want to bring out is verse 11 is the fact is when Isaiah turned to the Lord and says how long do I preach this message for um, and I think the Lord's response is until destruction comes until judgment comes upon Israel and uh, Judah right because remember the tribes were divided between Judah on one side and, and the 11 tribes of Israel right on account of David's son uh, I think it's like Rehoboam and Jeroboam uh, who, who had a dispute and one of them and the son of David or the son of Solomon lost the kingdom um, the 12 tribes and only was able to lead the one tribe but the bottom line is that the bottom line is that Isaiah here asks, how long um, do I preach this message to these people? And the Lord says, until judgment comes, until you see, until Nebuchadnezzar shows up and begins to judge the cities of Jerusalem and Israel, until uh, the judgment of God comes, you keep preaching that message, Isaiah. You don't stop preaching because we want to save the people um, from this judgment and the sin that's coming. We want to save the people from the idolatry that they've been practicing. Okay, we want to save those people. Now, when you go into the Old Testament, that whole theme of how long do we preach this message, when you go to um, Genesis, remember Genesis 6, 5, not only, um, remember when the Lord came to Noah and spoke to Noah um, and said to Noah um, that the... Um, that he wants to blot out man whom I have created because he he felt he was grieved in his heart right the scripture says and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart and the Lord said I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of Israel from the face of the land from uh, man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky for I am sorry that I have made man but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord so here um, in the Old Testament, way before the time of Isaiah, God was dealing with man again on the issue of sin, and he was grieved. But what the scripture doesn't tell us here in Genesis 6, but tells us in the New Testament, is that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So all that time, Noah um, was, all that time that Noah was building the ark, Noah was probably preaching to those people. He was probably preaching to the people of his generation so that they would repent until, um, uh, uh, you know, so that they would print, re would repent so that, um, so that the judgment of the Lord would not come upon them and destroy them. But the people would not, uh, you know, they would not repent of their sin. They would not stop sinning. They would not stop living out their sins. Um, how do you deal with a people who keep sinning and sinning and sinning, right? You join them in their sin, you mimic their sin, you do exactly as they do. You go into the temple's, uh, the, 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 the temple's idol or, or the idol's temple and you eat the food that they give you. Is that any different than me going to a porn store and eating the flesh of the wicked? Um, if that's what I'm being offered and given, not to injure the brother who has set me up to do this, right? Um, some of you by now are, are gasping at the fact that I just made that statement but what I'm trying to show you is that not to focus on me and um, my 
extracurricular activities or me dealing with the community and me dealing with the sin of the nation um, which they've brought me up to date on but it, it's that it's the comment of they don't want to hear the preaching and I was trying to show you that um, in Isaiah the Lord told Isaiah you keep preaching until judgment comes right in the Old Testament uh, further back in the days of Noah Noah had to keep preaching until the deluge of water came and I'm sure he did a good job at it when you look at the New Testament it's the it's the it's the same message when do you stop preaching you don't you preach in season and out of season you come to 2nd Timothy chapter 4 right verses 1 and 2 what does Paul say I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead by the appearing in his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season you reprove you rebuke you rebuke you exhort with great patience and instruction for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine right but wanting to have their ears tickled they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths but you be sober in all things endure hardship do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come so Paul you know in the first century was preaching his heart out and he didn't stop preaching his heart out until they cut off his head <coughs> so here we are in the 21st century and you know going back to the time of Noah who preached until the deluge Isaiah until Nebuchadnezzar came and took away uh, uh, Judah and in, 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 into captivity um, and of course the time of um, the Apostles when um, Paul basically preached until his head was cut off we today still if we go back into the text of Scripture how long do we preach for right Jesus in Matthew Matthew 24 Jesus in Matthew 24 does this he tells you know the, the disciple says well what will be the sign of your coming right what will be the sign of your coming and um, And he tells them what the sign of his coming will be destruction and tribulation right and then he says this and but to the one who endures to the end it is he who shall be saved right because we're talking about salvation he says in verse 14 and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world for a witness to all the nations and then the end will come so how long do we preach the gospel until the end comes we don't stop preaching in season and out of season until Christ returns right until we see the um, until we see the abomination of desolation in the temple until we see the tribulation of those days where the the Sun will go dark and the moon will give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken until we see the sign of the the coming of the Son of Man um, you know that will appear in the sky uh, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and and we will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with the power and great glory and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other we don't stop preaching this gospel until we see this sight that's how long we preach this gospel for um, And in verse 37, the scripture says this, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. For in those, for as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then they'll, and, and, and so, you know, it's like I was telling you, how long do we preach this gospel for? We never stop. We never stop preaching the gospel. The American people refuse to look at the earth and the heavens from God's point of view. And they've turned it into space explorations and movies and, and fighting demons and monsters, um, you know, underneath are black people. Um, rather than dealing with the reality and the truth of the scriptures.
So, you know, I was reading to you Second Timothy, and I took you on that rabbit trail there for a second, and I read you the first verse where it says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. So the difficult times are the beginning of birth pains preparing us for the misery that we're about to endure as Christians. The, the pain and the suffering, if Christians are going into porn stores to do the things that unbelievers are doing, right? And then coming back into the church and can't even report to the church and to its elder board and can't even report to the church and its ministers and other evangelists and can't even... Um, repent in front of the body of Christ and ask for forgiveness and can't come back to the body and say, how do I deal with this sin in these people's lives that have overtaken me? How do I deal with the sins of these Haitians? It's not my personal sin. It's not what I want to do. It's not what I want as a family, but this is what they've put me through. If you, you know, if, if we're the church and we can't embrace the gospel in our meetings because so many unbelievers have come and assimilated with us and we're afraid to lose the income you know we're afraid to lose the the membership all the people that come on Sunday morning then we have lost sight completely of what this gospel is about what Christ has left behind the kingdom of God and who we are as Christians who identify with God in Christ by faith so you know I, I read this I'm reading this here it says realize this this is the problem is we have not realized that we're in the last days we have not come to to the point where it's like this is the last days this is the days you know I was watching a movie last night called Jerusalem and um, I was trying to turn the movie on and the movie would not turn on and I'm like dang it I'm gonna watch this movie even if it kills me you know um, finally they decide to give me the movie right um, because they have the control over the computer and whether or not they want to give it to you, not give it to you. Anyway, the movie was about, the, the movie that they gave me was about a couple of young people, um, Americans going to Jerusalem and um, as tourists, they were supposed to go to Tel Aviv, but they decided to start their, um, they decided to start their trip in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, at the beginning of the movie, they, they gave you an, a 40 second video of some um, priests and Catholic church priests dealing with a, a demon possessed woman, a woman who has become an undead demon. And once they bite you or scratch you, worms start coming out of your, your, your neck, your body, your legs, wherever you've been bitten or, or, or cut by them, whatever the juice is in them, it basically turns you into what they are. Okay, you only need to make a short contact with them, a scratch on the face or a scratch in the neck or a bite somewhere and automatically your eyes begin to get black and you and you transform and you become something else. Um, so I was watching this movie and I thought more or less this is more of a documentary than it is a movie. Okay, um, and so I watched the whole thing just gasping, you know, it's like I cannot believe this is what's going on in Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, long story short, what was on the what was at the first 40 second video um of this movie became the reality of these uh, uh, became the reality of these tourists these three tourists um there's two two females and and this man uh whom they called kevin who was wearing th these glasses and i was watching the movie through her glasses and these glasses that um, she had on were like computer screens and all she had to do is speak to the glasses to the computer that was in the glasses and she could pull up information on 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 on, on the glasses and you could it's almost like a, a, a double uh, it, was, it was sort of like a double vision uh, computer where um, I could see everything through her eyes and um, I, it's, it's really fascinating the way they did it but in any way long story short um, about the middle of the movie, uh, a man comes out and um, gives them a warning that at Yom Kippur, there's going to be trouble, so they need to leave. They wouldn't leave. The one guy, Kevin, uh, starts going nuts, right? He starts going nuts, and um, they put him in, a, in, in an asylum to lock him up with a bunch of other people and the people are walking around banging their heads on the wall and they start saying weird things and weird voices coming out of them uh, basically they were demon possessed um, and um, the main character the woman who has the glasses on um, gets up on 
and I think she might have been like a Gabriel or something. But anyway, she gets on the um, she gets on the rooftop, and when she gets on the rooftop, she's um, she sees two airplanes. She sees two airplanes um, fly by, and the airplanes. Hold on a second here. They're giving me trouble again. So she sees these two airplanes fly by and drop two bombs. And as soon as the bombs are dropped, it's on the television and it's on her computer and she pulls up the screen and on her computer on the screen, she's able to see the news media and, and they explain that two bombs have just been dropped and people have been killed and there's blood all over the place. Um, and the demons come out. All the demons start coming out. Uh, uh, so, so now they have a war on their head, on their hands, and they also have these demons all over the place, running around, biting people and, and scratching people and devouring people. Um, there were a group of about six, seven people. At the end of the movie, only one person survived, and that was the guy, Kevin. And all the others died because they were bitten by, uh, by demons. Uh, the two women became uh, sick and demon possessed because they were bitten so many times. Um, the two security guards uh, were bitten and killed. Um, the, the the night clerk was killed. Uh, he committed suicide, uh, and another man was stuck here in, w with a knife. Point that I'm making is that the scripture says, "Realize this: that in the last days, difficult times will come. We are in the last days." With what I've explained to you at the beginning, with what I'm seeing in the movies today, with what um, is in the media and what is in the scriptures, we're in the last days. And, you know, the last days for us, like I said, is is is, is we're looking for thousands and thousands of years, right? Uh, we're, we're thinking Jesus is not coming back for another two, right? Another 2,000 years. But for him, it may be, um, I'm coming back next Tuesday. Next Tuesday may be, what, a couple days away from here? A couple days and um, for... Uh, but for us, it's 2,000 years from now, 3,000 years from now. So when I say we're living in the last days, the last days may be a, a, a long stretch, right? G Jesus um, uh, Jesus might have begun the last days, right? But, uh, you know, the, the scripture says that he's, uh, he's coming back, but at when? Right? We don't know. But the point is that realize this, we have to come to the realization, right? that in the last days difficult times will come and the difficulty of living as Christians um, and, and being able to only identify with Christ and not identify with people's sexuality you know the, the, the that, that's what we have to come to the realization in other words awareness we have to come to the awareness of the way the homosexual lives and the way the Christian lives the way the clan lives and the way the African slave lives I look at African people today and I go, man, you guys from this African community are not free because if you're still having, if you have to identify with someone's sexuality in order to claim freedom, then you're not, free. you're still not free. You're not there yet. You haven't made it because you're still, you have to call yourself community and practice homosexuality in order for you to act free, be free and, and do, and do, you know, do what you consider to be free, not as an American, but as the community. Okay, so there are still boundaries of, of how you can live um, in equality with these people. So that's the reason why I said earlier, as I was sitting here talking to those people in the back, and most of the time I'm hollering and screaming at the top of my lungs because I'm so angry at what they've done to me. And I said, you need to, you know, for the earth, we're in the last days before the moon and, and the sun and the stars fall on the earth, right? And so I told them, you know, just, you need to step outside of the earth and observe what God is doing, right? It's a fascinating picture when you can see the world spinning on its axis. That's the view that God sees, right? Unless he's looking at the earth through our eyes, you know, through the Holy Spirit. But, you know, in verse 2, he says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. There's going to be times of difficulty, times of war. Right? Times, times of friction where parents are going to turn against children and children are going to turn against parents. Right? So Paul writes here to Timothy and gives them a warning. And, and, and if you read in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Timothy having been released from jail. Right? Um, Timothy having been released from jail. So Timothy had already experienced some of these difficult days. Um, he says, men, for men will be lovers of self. Right? Uh, uh, they'll be self-consumed. Lovers of money. 
right? Greed. I was just recently watching American Greed, how this man pretended uh, he, he apparently used old bottles of wine to make himself into a millionaire. You know, and then filling up those old bottles uh, with new wine and then dating them back to 1950, 1940. And, you know, this is this was on the show American Green. And I just thought how clever, you know, but somebody found him out after he had bought all this expensive stuff. And only I end, I think I, I believe he might have even been killed as a result of it. But the scripture says, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, um, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these. For among them are those who in, enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected as, the regard, as regard the faith. Um, but they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. But you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution, suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors um, will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So I read you the whole chapter because um, I think it's important or at least, uh, yeah, the whole chapter, so that you understand the context in which uh, Paul is telling Timothy here that in come to this conclusion in awareness that in the last days, difficult, difficult times will come, just like Jesus predicted. Difficult times will come, but we must continue to preach the gospel even in the midst of all of our difficulties, in the midst of all the abuse, in the midst of all the, uh, uh, the doubts, uh, the fact that God is not speaking to us, God is not answering our prayers, God is not uh, actively involved in our day-to-day -day life. What he's given to us is a gospel, uh, a good news, and it's like leaving your kid at daycare. But before leaving your kid at daycare, you know, you tell your kid, um, here's, a, here's a cue card. You know, remember these instructions. Don't fight the boys. Don't play with the... Uh, don't steal the children's toys. Um, and, and your kid who is at daycare who reads the cue card have to keep that in mind as he lives out his day in this daycare and also until you come back to pick him up or to pick her up right so remember what mom said remember what dad said and this is what and this is where it's written and then you follow these instructions when I come back we'll go get some ice cream if you do exactly as I have uh, instructed in these cue cards okay that's what the gospel is saying here Paul tells Timothy difficult times are going to come. Uh, this is what men are going to be like. He gives Timothy a whole list of um, faulty characteristics of what people are going to be like um, in, in the world and what people are going to be like in the church, what people are going to be like in Israel, what people are going to be like both as believers and unbelievers. When you read the book of Daniel, Daniel tells you that um, some are going to fall away from the faith. Right? And others are, I think it's like Daniel 11, there, there are, I, Matthew 24 tells you that some are going to fall away from the faith. Some of them, their love is going to grow cold. Um, others are going to be bitter, angry, frustrated, like I usually am on a daily basis because of the difficult times that have come. The difficult times that have come and I'm lacking in fellowship um, and I'm lacking in Christian leadership. Where the, 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 the scripture says, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Um, yesterday I had to go to um, to one of those stores and of course nobody showed up and uh, it was friction all, all that time I won't tell you what happened because you'll be upset um, at, at, at what what how I respond what I did how I responded afterward uh, one of the pastors very famous very well known sent me uh, 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 um, 
one of their monthly newsletters, but because he had completely disrespect me in the community, I tore it up and I threw it away in the gutter. Um, and so when the scripture says difficult times will come, Christians are going to be standing against Christians, toe to toe. Christians are going to be standing against Christians because they will have forgotten these warnings and this gospel and the fact that God had warned Old Testament, New Testament, when do we stop preaching? Jesus, when do we stop preaching the word of God? We don't ever stop preaching the word of God until he returns. Noah, don't stop preaching until you see water fall from the sky. Isaiah, don't stop preaching until you see Nebuchadnezzar come and remove those people and the temple is completely destroyed. Paul, don't stop. Timothy, don't stop preaching in season and out of season. Jesus says, don't stop preaching until you see the abomination of desolation, until the second coming of Christ. When you see me in the sky, you keep preaching that Bible, you keep teaching that Bible. It doesn't matter if Kevin DeCleron dies, if Kevin DeCleron falls, if Kevin DeCleron falls, you keep preaching that message of salvation until our Lord returns. Why? Because that is going to assure salvation to the souls, for yourself and for others. So Paul tells Timothy here that for men will be lovers of what? Of self. We won't even go there. We won't even go there. The hair, the makeup, the body, the and everything else that comes with it, the muscle, the in the you know, lovers of self, lovers of money, oh the greed of, of of the American heart, boasting. We won't talk about boasting, arrogance, reviling, disobedience. Oh, and on and on and on. You know, you could you could look up all of these. Uh, um, these words, conceit, right? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And, 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 and you know, it, it, it's so rich what Paul is saying here. But the warning and the reminder is that um, men are going to be this way the same way they were with Moses. Remember, Janus and Jambres were the, the men who opposed Moses and who opposed the truth that God had put, put in the mouth of Moses for the, for the, uh, for the Israelite people right men of depraved mind paul calls them rejecting of rejected as regards of the truth right of, of the faith um and and he talks about them but then he reminds timothy this is special he reminds timothy remember boy remember that with me you followed my teaching you followed my conduct in the last days don't be like those men who love themselves and who loves money Okay, but you need to be, you need to remember my teaching and my conduct and my purpose and my faith, my patience and my love, and my perseverance. He didn't say you need to remember my sexuality and how that I was open and affirming. He didn't say you need to remember how we went to the club and we did that, or we went to the store and did that, or we went to uh, this place and remember we did that video together. No, he doesn't go there with Timothy. He doesn't go sexual. He, do, he goes spiritual. He never touches Timothy's sexuality. He never even addresses Timothy um, needing a female. It's not when he addresses the issue of Timothy needing a female, he addresses it in the first book in the context of, in the context of Timothy, these are the qualifications for an elder. These are the qualifications for a man who, who aspires to the office of an overseer. He says to Timothy, he must be the husband of one wife, one who takes care of his own children, of his own household. That's how he addresses the issue of Timothy's sexuality in the context of the qualification of an elder needing a wife and being able to lead his own household as well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Apart from that, Paul never touches the man's sexuality in the scriptures. He never touches the man's sexuality. That's the only place. Even when he writes the letter to the Roman church, he doesn't give you details as to where he was, who he was with, what he did, when he did it, how he did it, where and when and what. Whereas in our American society, we love details. We love videos. Um, yesterday, when I was in that place, a man started coming out. He had this big sign on his chest that says for rent. And he kept on taking out his 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 camera or or, or better yet his, his telephone and I suspected that he wanted to videotape me and take my picture right in those places and I thought to myself no I don't I don't need you to do that I'll do it myself you know I'll, I'll, I'll give the American church a, a grandiose tour of where I've been brought to by your American community and how you have brought me down I don't I don't need that so I walked out but bottom line of what I'm saying is that this is this is this is what we're dealing with those of us who are evangelists 
that's what God has put on my plate to deal with. I don't know about the rest of you. You may have a, a squeaky clean uh, Christian faith and where everything is hunkadory and all the Christians come on Friday night, Saturday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and everybody's praying together and holy brothers and we're taking bread and we're breaking bread and we're doing all of this stuff and everything is wonderful. That's not my Christian life. I wish it was my Christian leadership, but it's not. As you can see, I have no Timothys and I have no Tituses and no Silases. Uh, the only thing I'm dealing with are, are facts and they don't want to talk about Jesus. They don't want to talk about my books. They don't want to talk about the salvation that I talk about uh, out here in Pioneer Square. The only one thing they want to know is if I'm willing to submit to them as a fag and as a slave. Uh, the only thing they want to know is if, if it's okay for Gabriel to do that. And most of the time, Gabriel takes it from my body rather than me offering it to her. And then, of course, they punish my body for it afterwards. So when I talk about difficult times will come in the last days, this is come to the realization, church, we are in the difficult times. We are in the difficult times. Talk to the men of your church. Talk to the individual brothers, the individual men, and see where they're at with this list. See where they're at with this list. And ask them, are you men preaching the gospel? You know, are you men doing the work of an evangelist? Are you men keeping up with a Christian faith that you profess, right? Paul says, remember, right? Um, remember what the author of Hebrews says, remember those who led you who preached the word of God to you and imitate their faith, right? This is what Paul is emphasizing here. You know, remember my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my patience, my faith, my love, perseverance, persecutions, suffering as has happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, the persecutions I endured in all of them, and all the Lord delivered me, right? And he warns them in verse 12, it says, if you desire to live godly in Christ, you're going to be persecuted, Tim. You are going to be persecuted. They're going to tear your heart apart. They're going to eat your flesh like it's chicken, okay? And, and the heart that they give you is going to shock you. Right? You're going to be all ganged up for flesh, flesh, flesh 24 7, 7 days a week. And what you're going to forget is the, the, the Spirit of God. Remember, Paul says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So, in, in chapter 3 here, the reason why men are lovers of self and lovers of money is because they're walking not in the Spirit of God, in the Spirit of Christ, but they're walking by what? Not the Holy Spirit, but by the fleshy Spirit. Right, and it is the flesh that is they're fleshy here. This is this is the manifestation of men who are fleshy when he when we're talking about ungodliness and the pleasures, lovers of pleasures. Sometimes you have to give the unbeliever what he's asking for. You know, the scripture says, Give to Caesar what is Caesar, and give to Christ what is Christ. So you can bring it back up and says, I gave you what? I gave you sin rather than salvation. Why did you want sin instead of salvation? God wants to deliver you from that sin. Why don't you take God at his word, me at my word, and put your faith in God for salvation. Put your faith in God for the Holy Spirit rather than us going into that you know, going into that place of sin. Why don't we go to the place of worship instead of meeting always at that place, uh, 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 those taboo places? Why don't we? Why don't you come on a Friday night Bible study? It'll just be just you and me, but we'll have something different to talk about. You know, instead of talking about each other's flesh, why don't we talk about the Spirit of God and the God who is, you know, uh, over this over this earth here, right? It, it, it's it, it's like how, how about we we change positions, right? Instead of going. Instead of constantly flesh, 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 why don't we go spirit and give God an opportunity to minister to us through his spirit and through his word, right? Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. So I'm coming up to a conclusion here. So Paul says, uh, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He reminds Timothy of the Old Testament scriptures, which is what Paul himself grew up on. And this is not counting his epistles and the gospels. Right. So he, he, he reminds Timothy of the 39 books of the, of, the, of the Old Testament. And he says, remember the scriptures, remember the Old Testament prophets that you grew up, uh, uh, grew up with. Right. Remember that from childhood, you've learned the sacred writings. Right. And, and they've given you wisdom, the Psalms and the, and the uh, Ecclesiastes and the Songs of Solomon. Right. The, the, the minor prophets that, and all of that leads to salvation through faith now in Christ Jesus. Timothy, all of those writings of those of those prophets uh, prepared you for the salvation that you are now living 
in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, what happens? In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Things are, I mean, it's going to go crazy because people, and they are going to want to persecute you, right? But you remember the, 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 the example that I set for you. You remember the fact that I, I spoke to you, I prayed with you, you saw me go to jail, you saw me endure all of that. You remember the scriptures. He didn't say, he, he reminded Timothy of the example he said, he reminded Timothy of the scriptures that he lived, he reminded Timothy of the suffering that he's going to suffer when those difficult times come. And so tonight, I'm doing the same thing with you. You heard how I began this, right? My, I began with my difficult times, my miseries, my pains, right? Paul says that he was beaten 39, uh, three times, given 39 lashes. When you go into 1 Corinthians, uh, the scripture, when you go into 1 Corinthians, the scripture says that Paul, so he, he, was, he was given uh, 39 lashes three times. He suffered shipwreck, homelessness, uh, poverty, beatings, uh, death, resurrection. I mean, the whole thing, the man went through hell. Okay, and, and, and so, it, you know, and finally he says, he, he, he does this for Timothy. He says, all scripture is inspired by God, Tim. He says, remember, he says, realize that in the, come to the conclusion that in the last day, difficult times will come. But then if, if, if Timothy was to start losing hope, as a result of the difficult times, as a result of all the persecutions that he's going to endure as a believer, right? He says, remember that scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. Now, if Paul's example wasn't enough, he brings him back to what? The scriptures, the very scriptures that he was studying that interested Paul in his life of faith. And that was the door that Paul entered into Timothy's life because Timothy had a good reputation of being a man of the faith. And so because of that, Paul brings back the scriptures, which was the original door that he had opened in Timothy's life, and um, that had brought him into Timothy's life. And he says um, to Timothy, scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for training, for correction and righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Guess what? Even though difficult times will come, he brings Timothy all the way back to what? good work. He brings Timothy back to what? Scripture. He brings Timothy back to what? The man of God. He brings Timothy back to what? The equipping of God's Word. Even though all of these bad things are happening to you, even though all of this evil is going to be around you and what men are going to be living all around you, wherever you're at, whether you're in Antioch, whether you're in Iconium, whether you're in Jerusalem, whether you're in um, uh, Asia Minor, this is what life is going to be like in the last days. This is what men are going to be like everywhere around you. But you, and this is the heart, this is the heart of what, but, but you, however, you, you, Timothy, it doesn't matter how many men fall before you after you're behind. He says, but you continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of. Now, does this mean that Timothy's life is going to be perfect? No, because all of this is going to affect him. The whole thing is going to affect them. That's why he says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. What is he going to be persecuted with in the last days? He's going to be persecuted with men who love themselves, men who love money, men who are boastful, men who are arrogant, men who are revilers, men who are disobedient, men who are ungrateful, men who are unholy. When they see the holiness of Timothy, is that going to draw them near? No, it's going to push them away. They're going to want to take Timothy into the idol's temple. They're going to want to take Timothy in the wrong place to practice the wrong things and do the wrong things. So Timothy has, you know, back then he had, you know, Paul basically prepared him for what was coming. And from what uh, Hebrew says, Timothy was released from jail. So he probably, before Paul passed away, he probably, you know, they started giving it to him. Right? He was the disciple that Paul had used repeatedly for a long time to do the work of the ministry. Right? And um, it says here in verse 23, Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I shall see you. Right? Read all your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. This is the author of Hebrews talking and saying, take, take what? Take notice, right? That our brother Timothy has been released. So Timothy did undergo the, uh, uh, the persecution uh, that Paul had prepared him for. Why? He was of Paul's spirit. 
He was just like Elijah, just like Elisha was of the spirit of Elijah, right? Just like uh, um, Solomon was probably of the spirit of David. That's why God allowed him to have a thousand women. Um, the people that we, the people that influences us, have uh, have a way of passing on their spirit, uh, their struggles, their difficulties from themselves to us. And when they pass away, the society now turns around and go, um, remember what? Remember the transition between Peter and Jesus. They came to Peter three times, right? And they said, weren't, weren't you one of uh, Jesus' disciples? I mean, I remember you were with that Galilean, that Nazarene. You were one of them, weren't you? And Peter says, no, I don't know. Get, get away from me. I don't know that man. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. I never knew who he was, you know? Um, and so, you know, who knows what Timothy went through to deny Paul, yeah, deny Christ. I mean, when persecution is right in your face, what do you do? You say, nah, there ain't, there, there ain't no God. You know, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about, right? The gun is right in your face. There a God? Is there a Christ? Where is, where is your Jesus now? Huh? Where is your Jesus now? Um, why isn't your Jesus, you know, why, why isn't your Jesus serving you now, Kevin? Right? Oh, go ahead. Tell me about Jesus' love, Kevin. Tell me about Jesus' love. So, You've, you've watched a lot of my videos, those of you who have, and you heard me weep and wail and cry. It's because of what I'm saying here tonight. We're in a different, the time, you know, we're in a, uh, uh, what, does, what does the scripture say uh, in Acts chapter 2? Uh, we're in a perverse generation, right? A perverse generation, and this is what happens in a perverse generation. A generation that has been turned over to sin. A generation that has been turned over to Satan where you can watch a movie and see demons flying all over the place, right? Modern day demons, modern day people transform uh, right in front of your eyes, in front of a camera, live. It's a, it's a shock. It's a shock to see that this is what's going on. Um, and it's like, well, do I believe this to be for real or is this just a movie? <laughs> you know, is this, is this a real documentary or is this just a bunch of people running around with makeup on? You know, what, what kind of, <laughs> You know, is, is this for real or is this just a joke? You know, okay. But the main character here's name is Kevin and I'm a Kevin. It's like, oh, what is this? You know, and then the music comes on and the movie ends. And you're like, thank God it was a movie. And woo, you know, it's kind of scary. But, you know, I take this, this, this hour here tonight and I would have wanted to encourage the church if they had come out, but they didn't. I've been uh, yelling and cussing and, and uh, MacArthur out in the back and um, challenging him to come out of the back, but John will not budge. Neither will Gabriel, um, neither will the gay community and the government. They're all back there hiding um, behind uh, closed doors in other rooms. Even as I'm doing this video here, they're back there. Um, you know, pray for me, church. Pray that God will bless me with the Spirit. Pray that God will um, keep me from stumbling. And when you and you know stumbling blocks are gonna come. We live in a generation where stumbling blocks are gonna come. I don't have a, a ministry among the homosexual community. I just have their rod on my back. I don't have a ministry among them where I have a church where they come and they worship and they pray and they come as couples or they come as singles. Um, to look for partnership. I don't I don't have that. God has not given me that kind of ministry. He's given he's opened the door for me to preach the gospel in Portland, but that's it. That's all that I get to do is preach. And I can't do it every single day. You know, I gotta have some form of an income. So I go and I work um sometimes with labor ready and even then I'm dealing with them there. Um in whatever the company that they put me in and I and and you know and I keep my mouth shut at labor ready. I don't tell them about the gospel. I don't, I don't start preaching and proselytizing to them, even though they know that's who I am. Um, they follow me to taboo, and they follow me to those places, and of course, and under their breath, they insult me and tell me, you know, you're a fag, you're a queer. But as far as the gospel is concerned, they won't open their mouth once to tell me, hey, I saw you preaching out there. You know, um, is that salvation message for real? Uh, I had an experience the other day with a young man who was there. Uh, he was he was manifesting an ability that I, as a Christian, was not able to give back or to match. And I thought to myself, is that the Holy Spirit or is that a demon giving him that kind of power? And he he, he exuded more power than I did. 
All I was able to do was quote scripture and verse. I mean, as far as laying hands on someone to receive the Holy Spirit and healing someone, I, the Lord didn't give that to me. I don't know who out there has that power, but you know, I'm a, I'm a preacher and a pastor at heart and a teacher of the Word of God. But as far as healing is concerned and um, having the authority of an apostle, uh, God has not come down and confirmed that to me. And so, you know, I don't ever want to uh, deceive anybody to think that uh, I'm, I'm on that apostolic level when all I am is just a preacher, right? All I am is one who heralds the Word of God as an evangelist. Uh, if God ever finds it in his heart for me to pastor a church, it'll be a miracle. You know, that'll be the very biggest miracle that I'd ever experienced. But I'm going to stop right there because uh, in a couple seconds, it'll be a, an hour and a half that I've been talking here. And this will be my third message of the day, or fourth message of the day. And I think I, the people of this apartment complex have heard more than enough of me uh, yelling and screaming and carrying on like a madman for me to now uh, put up, uh, you know, give them another message. And then, of course, now I'm going to upload this. And um, the sermon, I don't know if I'm going to try to do a sermon for on God, uh, God wants us to change. Right, and probably this is my last message on God wants us to change, and then uh, I believe the Lord wants me to focus on something else. Um, so let me go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for this day, and I pray that uh, you know when I forget, Lord God, that we're in the last days, and I forget that you call us to holiness and sanctification and righteousness. That because your word says, "Be holy, for I am holy." Uh, your word says uh, in, to the church of Thessalonica that you desire sanctification from us. Um, and the word tells us, Lord God, we are um, that the just shall live by faith um, and, and righteousness. You saw, no, you saw Abraham as the father of our faith, as a righteous man. Um, and so, Lord, even today in the 21st century, you expect us to be of the mind of, of Abraham. The believer you expect us to be of the mind of the prophet despite the fact that the world around us is sexually driven as for us your kingdom your children those of us that are single uh, and don't have families those of us that are married with families those of us that are in full-blown church leadership and others of us that are um, by the wayside castaways you want us to trust in you and put our faith in you um, this time of prayer reminds me Lord God of um, Jeremiah who was a prophet of Israel and he had to flee from the king and the queen Ahab and Jezebel uh, and live in the wilderness father and I remember how you provided food through a raven and you provided uh, bread and water for him sometimes our Christianity leads us Lord God to the wilderness away from everybody so that we could be safe um, from the antichrists that are in the world um, father I pray that uh, you would uh, work on my behalf in this situation that I'm in with the Franklins and MacArthur's Lord God and Grace Community Church and the gay community and the clan. I pray, Father, that you would deliver me from these people's sins. And I pray, Lord God, if there is something that I've missed that I don't understand, that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would also, Lord God, um, help me to understand it from a scriptural point of view, from your point of view, how to deal with the issues, Lord. Um, I don't have any supporters out here and I'm battling these people on in the I feel like in the forefront of my faith Lord God to keep my faith I pray father that you would send your spirit to fall not only upon me but to fall upon all of Portland and the West Coast Lord God uh, the people in the West Coast are wicked Lord God exceedingly and they need your forgiveness and salvation so I pray father that you would enlighten the churches with your spirit and you would enlighten the heart and the mind of the unbelieving with the spirit so that they may believe and so they can sit so that they can continue to carry out um, your will in their lives I pray for your protection I pray for your salvation I pray for your guide um, I pray for your uh, discretion and direction in the scriptures that you will not leave me out here by myself that Lord you will provide for me uh, you'll provide all my needs for me as you have provided it for for many ministers that have come before me and will continue to come even after I'm gone. May you bless the church, Lord, uh, the church of the end times. May you bless those people, Father, because times of difficulty will come to engulf them. May they remember um, Matthew 24. May they remember, Lord God, um, Psalms, the Psalms. And may they remember, Lord God, uh, the, the scripture that we read tonight in, 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 in Timothy. Lord, may they remember the word 
um, when difficult times come, Lord God, and may they continue to trust in you. Um, I pray for the people of Jerusalem, Lord. I don't know if what has uh, taken what I saw in the video was real or if it was just uh, an acting uh, a thing that had taken place, but I pray for the people of Jerusalem, Lord, for the Israelites and also for the Arabs. Pray, Father, um, if there are demons that are out as far out as I saw last night in the movie, that you would be with the authorities, Lord God, and give them the power to fight off these demonic forces. May your spirit come mightily upon the churches to um, destroy the kingdom of darkness and Satan that seems to have taken a residence in Jerusalem, Lord God, and has removed the Christian faith out of Jerusalem. May you restore the Christian faith, Lord God, back to the people. Um, may you uh, continue to strengthen those who bear the gospel as evangelists and as pastors. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, with that in mind, um, I'm going to let you go, and hopefully I'll be able to preach the gospel sometime soon, and you can hear sermon number four. Keep me in your prayers, and I'll do my best to keep you in yours. God bless.